Good evening, everyone, and welcome back to our live streaming Sunday night Bible class here at Bethlehem Lutheran Church in Germantown. Certainly glad that you joined us today, either live or because the Packers are playing tonight. Maybe you're watching the archive version, uh, and that's fine. So um, we're going to be picking up where we left off last week. So the lesson um, that was posted in the Facebook feed last week is what you want to have pulled up. It's called The Vine and the Branches, Part 4 covering John 15, 9 to 17. And we're going to be beginning at the top of page 3 with John 15, 13. That's where we're going to start tonight. And so what I'd like to do um, is we'll begin with prayer, and then we'll kind of just remind ourselves of what the, the flow of thought in 9 to 12, and then we'll launch into 13. But let's begin our study with prayer. So we pray. Lord Jesus, you call us to do difficult tasks of Christian faithfulness, and yet we remember that none of them are as difficult as what you accomplished for us on the cross. Our faithfulness must flow from faith in you, and so we ask that you would bless our study of your word this evening, that you would increase our faith, our appreciation of what you have done for us, and that you would strengthen and empower us to love others as you have loved us. We ask all things, this and all things in your holy name. Amen. Okay, so uh, again, just a kind of brief reminder of where we, uh, what we covered last week. Uh, we started in verse 9. We noticed that the language of the extended metaphor of the vine and the branches begins to fall away. And that's in 1 through 8. That's the extended metaphor. And in its place, we have Jesus more directly addressing the disciples about the meaning of that extended metaphor. Um, and so, uh, and we, we notice that the, the theme, kind of the, the word around which this whole paragraph uh, revolves is the word love. Right? It starts with the description of the love that exists between the Father and the Son. Um, there's a description of the, the love of the Son for the people, for his people, and the command to remain in his love. Um, the instruction, the way that we remain in his love is by keeping his commands, and that there is a, a, a correspondence or connection between our keeping Jesus' commands and his keeping of the Father's commands, so that when we follow Christ's command, we are following the pattern that he has set down for us. Uh, we heard in verse 11, we heard Jesus talk about joy, both his joy and ours, so his joy is made complete as we obey his commands, as we live out our faith. That is the reason for which we have been redeemed. Remember, we haven't just been redeemed from things. We've also been redeemed for things, for service. And as Jesus sees us perform that service, his joy as our Savior is brought to its goal. And then we also, our joy is made complete as we actually live out the calling for which we were created, to love God and to love others, something that only Christians are able to do. And then um, the, there's a kind of a mini climax. It's a really good place to put our break. Um, verse 12, Jesus summarizes his commands. Remember throughout this paragraph, um, the way that you express love for Jesus or the way you remain in Jesus' love is by keeping his command. And here is the summary of his command. This is, what, uh, this is what following Jesus is all about, in a nutshell, is love each other as I have loved you. And the rest of the paragraph is going to be an expansion on that command. Love other or love each other as I have loved you. And so we're going to see it right at the beginning of 13. We're going to see Jesus speak about his love for us. Because we are called to love others the way that he has loved us. So first, we're going to see what he, how he has loved us. And then we'll advance the thought down um, from there. I'll also just say before we keep going, we're going to do a little bit of polemics tonight. Um, polemics is the study of refuting incorrect theology. And we're going to have the opportunity to talk about Calvinism and Arminianism, which are kind of two sides, two different opposites of the theological perspective. And we'll talk a little bit about what they say and why we're using these verses to respond to them as we get there. I just want to tuck that away in the back of your mind. 
But with that in play, let's go ahead and read verse 13. So remember verse 12, my command is this, love each other as I have loved you. Well, how have you loved us, Jesus? Verse 13, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends. Okay, so a couple of interesting things to note about this verse. This is a very famous verse, um, a, a verse that is kind of alluded to in Romans that someone might lay down their life for a righteous person, right? But God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. You might um, summarize or rephrase the verse as, there's no greater expression of love for a person than to give your life for another. Right? That is the highest expression of love that, that can be imagined, to give your life for another human being. But the second thing I want you to note is um, how this language, the language of verse 13, is evocative of the Good Shepherd discourse in chapter 10. Okay? So we read in chapter 10, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The exact same verb. The reason my father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I have received from my father. So you see these connections between John 15 and John 10. You have the concept of love, the reason that the father loves the son. It's because of his laying down of his life and that this is his command. This is God's command that Jesus is fulfilling. Right? So there's all kinds of linguistic connections between chapter 10 and chapter 15, which I think is, you know, is interesting in and of itself. It's also one of those things we want to appreciate, just the literary beauty of the gospel itself, the way that these themes and concepts and language are interspersed throughout the entirety of the gospel. But maybe even most importantly of all, um, as we are called to love others as Christ has loved us, it's so important that we remember that the, the power or the strength or the motivation to do that comes not from within us, but from the sacrifice of Jesus, right? The reason that we want to love others is because God has loved us. The reason we are willing to lay down our life for others is because Christ laid down his life for us. The reason that we love is because he loved us. In fact, we're going to get a little more expansion of that in the next verse. Right? So um, a few things just notice in that verse, um, this kind of great illustration or discussion of what true love is. It's giving yourself up for another. Of course, Jesus did that in, in the most you know, complete of ways. He literally gave up his righteousness so that we might have it. He suffered hell so that we don't. He died so that we can live. Um, but that, really, you can give up your life for others each and every day, right? Every time that you love another and do what's in their best interest, regardless of what it costs you to do that. You can give up your life for your spouse, for your children, for your coworkers, for your neighbors. It means putting other people ahead of yourself and, and, and doing for them what's in their best interest regardless of what it costs you. In some respects, um, I kind of wish we could just do it once, right? That could one, this one great um, display of love. You give up your life once and for all. But what Jesus asks us to do is to give up our life for others every single day, day in and day out, to die to self and to live for God and others. Um, this is the greatest expression of that is found in Jesus, but it is that expression that encourages and motivates us to show that in our everyday lives as well. Okay, so with that being said, we're going to move on to verse 14. I'm actually going to read 13 again because we want to connect 13 and 14. So verse 13, Jesus says, Greater love has no one than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you do what I command. Okay, so there's, I'm going to suggest there's a, a beautiful relationship or a beautiful connection between verses 13 and 14 that using Lutheran theological terminology, 
we would describe as the relationship between justification and sanctification. Verse 13 is an expression of justification. Verse 14 is an expression of sanctification. Now, the way that you see that may not be immediately obvious, I think especially in verse 14. My hope is that all Lutherans would be able to see why 13 is an expression of objective justification. Um, but in what ways is verse 14 um, an, uh, an appropriation of subjective justification? So just really quickly, let's talk about those two terms. Okay? So objective justification is the biblical truth that when Jesus died on the cross, he died to take away the sins of the whole world. It doesn't matter who you are or what you've done, or whether you believe in him. Um, the sins of the whole world are forgiven at that moment. When Christ cries out, it is finished, then the entire world's sin, everyone who has ever lived is living or will ever live, their sins are forgiven. It's objectively true, whether you know it or you believe it. It is true. That's why it's called objective justification. But there's another side of the coin. Right? Because while it is true that Christ has died for the sins of all, and all sins are forgiven, it is also true that one only benefits, personally benefits from that objective reality if they believe it through faith. So subjective justification is the biblical truth that through the work of the Spirit, um, we are the confidence or the faith of a trust that what Jesus has done for the world is true of me as an individual. That's subjective justification. Okay, so objective justification, the fact that Jesus died for the whole world. Subjective justification, the confidence that he died for me. Having faith that what Jesus did for the world is my own personal possession. So I want you to see how verse 13 is an expression of objective justification. Greater love has no one than this. To lay down one's life for one's friends. Well, for whom did Jesus lay down his life? For whom did Jesus die? The answer is everyone in the whole world. Everyone who ever has lived is living or will ever live. Um, that's um, Jesus giving up his life or laying down his life is an objective reality that applies to all people of all time. But verse 14, Jesus says, How do you become my friend? How do you personally benefit? from the work of laying down my life. And he describes this relationship in terms of doing what I command. Um, so there is a, there's a response that is required from believers. There, um, there is a response that, that we give to Christ's sacrifice for us. In this case, the expression of faith that is in commandment keeping. That is an expression of our faith, of our um, subjective justification. Um, so if you look at the sheet, I have these two, these are two um, of the clear white bullet points. Jesus says that he lays down his life for his friends, but of course Jesus lays down his life for all, so that's objective justification. By being one of Jesus' friends mean res means responding to that love and faith, subjective justification. Jesus' work on the cross becomes our own personal possession through faith. So we have, uh, in these two verses, one of the great themes of John 15, which is that we love Jesus by keeping his commandments, right? The connection between Jesus' love and or love for Jesus and commandment keeping. Now, one of the things that's really important for us to do or to kind of wrestle with is exactly what Jesus is saying in verse 14. Because it's very easy to misunderstand verse 14. If you read it in, in a... I don't want to get too linguistically nerdy on you, but if, if you read it as a certain kind of conditional statement, you're going to read it wrong. You, can, um, you read it kind of in a Roman Catholic way. So if you read verse 14, you are my friends if you do what I command. You might understand that statement as being... Being as that um, your relationship with Jesus is dependent on your commandment keeping. If you keep my commandments, then you will be my friends. That is a way that a person might hear and understand that verse. But we know from the rest of Scripture that that can't be what Jesus is saying in that verse. That is mixing 
um, justification and sanctification, right? Um, if that were the way we were to, if we had to interpret verse 14, then Jesus would be saying that our obedience is what leads to our status as Jesus' friends, when we know that in reality it's the other way around. It is because we are Jesus' friends that we keep his commands. So what Jesus is expressing here is what we in, in the theological or in the linguistic business would call a first-class conditional. Um, and basically what he's saying here, he's not saying that being a friend of Jesus is dependent on our keeping his commandment. Um, recur, recall earlier in, Je in this chapter Jesus' statement that his disciples are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Right? Um, that's what makes you uh, a friend of Jesus. The, the word that God spoke. It's objectively true. It's not dependent on your obedience. However, the natural result of, of what Jesus did for us, of responding to that in faith, is going to be commandment keeping. So this is the natural outflowing of being Jesus' friend. You will keep his commands. It's kind of like um, a, one of the classical first-class conditional um, explanations is something like, um, if the ground is wet, then you know it rained. If the ground is wet, then you know it rained. The reason that's a, an example of a first-class conditional is because we would never suggest that the ground being wet is what causes it to rain. Right? That would be flipping the conditional statement upside down. We know that the reason the ground is wet is because it rained, not the other way around. And that's how we should understand verse 14 as a first class conditional. The reason that we are Jesus' friends is not because we obey. The reason that we obey is because we are Jesus' friends. That's how we should understand the conditional statement in verse 14. And again, um, it, it, what makes it difficult is that we don't really have class conditionals in English like the great languages do, like Greek and Latin do. Um, so uh, it's, it's, kinda, it's not always immediately obvious to us how we are to understand a conditional statement. Um, and, and so I just want to maybe walk you through that. The way that we understand verse 14 is, first of all, in the context of John 15. Right? The context is that you are made clean by the word that Jesus speaks to you. That God lays down, that Jesus lays down his life even when you were his enemies. There's no way that you can interpret verse 14 in a quote unquote Roman Catholic way um, and stay faithful to the context of John 15. But then after that, you, you can incorporate the whole context of Scripture as a whole which tells us that we are saved by grace alone through faith alone. Um, so since we believe that God's word cannot be broken, that the whole thing is consistent from beginning to end, you can use other statements of scripture to help you understand um, other statements of scripture, right? In fact, this is one of the great principles of proper biblical interpretation, is that you use clear passages to help you understand the less clear passages. So this passage might be understood in a multiple of ways. So how do we pick the correct way? Well, we interpret this verse in the light of the rest of Scripture. So this is a great example of proper interpretation, where you let the immediate context of the, of the section and the wider context of Scripture help us un properly understand a verse that could be understood in, a multiple, in multiple ways. Okay? Okay. Um, now, the other thing I, I want to say here is that we have um, this very interesting analogy introduced here. It's actually introduced in verse 13, when Jesus says that greater love has no one than this, that he lays down his life for his friends. Okay, but that's kind of an interesting way of talking. And then he immediately brings back that friend idea. You are my friend. Okay, and by, um, The natural result of being my friend is that you will keep my commandments. And then we're going to hear um, about this, why that we're going to get the payoff for the friend metaphor in the next verse, in verse 15. Okay, so I'm, I'm just going to hold that for now, put a pen in that, and we're going to come back to it. But I just want you to see how verses 13 and 14 
build up to the kind of the payoff of this particular, maybe kind of strange analogy of G as us as Jesus' friends. Okay, well then we're going to take kind of a little break here. We're going to en engage in our first polemical statement. Okay, um, and this is going to be against Calvinism. Okay, so Calvinism um, is named after its founder, John Calvin, though there are a whole bunch of scholarly works out there that, that wonder exactly um, was Calvin really a good Calvinist and kind of he wasn't um, so really Calvinism is, is made uh, is solidified not by Calvin but by his successor a man by the last name of Beza um, and so but what Cal Calvinism has a lot of really good things in it a lot of very true things Calvinism for example supports the total depravity of human beings that we come into this world holy and only sinful, right? Um, it, 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 uh, it teaches that we cannot, by our own thinking or choosing, believe in Jesus Christ our Lord or come to him. That, that faith is entirely and only a gift of the Holy Spirit. It's not something that we create ourselves. It's something that God gives to us. So there's a tremendous amount of overlap between Calvinist and Lutheran teaching. Um, Calvin was a great admirer of Luther. However, there are some things uh, about Lutheran theology that Calvin specifically objected to. And one of those things, as, as Calvin thought theologically, one of the things that he couldn't deal with, that he couldn't accept, was this idea that Jesus would die for unbelievers. And I, maybe as Lutherans that surprises us, but what I... I want you to try to put yourself in Calvin's shoes, right? Calvin is worried that, that Jesus would die in vain, right? How can we imagine the Son of God dying for people who are going to reject him, right? I mean, what does that mean about the extent of the atonement? If Jesus is paying for sins of people who don't personally benefit from the payment of their sins, and so Calvin very famously taught what we call the limited atonement. Calvin said that when Jesus died on the cross, he died to forgive only the sins of believers. That Jesus did not die to take away the sins of the whole world. Though when Jesus died, he died to take away of the sins of his people, of believers, of what he would call the elect. Okay? And when you read Calvin on the extent of the atonement, he very frequently alludes to John 15, 14. This is the verse, that one of the verses, that he posits teaches the limited atonement. And I want you to, to look at verse 14 again. Um, or sorry, it's verse 13. It's verse 13 that, you, that Calvin uses as the basis for his limited atonement. I want you to look at verse 13, through, try to look at it through Calvin's eyes, and see how you might see this verse as teaching a limited atonement, right? Jesus says, greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's life for one's friends, and you are my friends if you do what I command. So Calvin says, look, there it is. Jesus says that he lays down his life for believers, because believers are the one who do what God commands. So um, this is a it's a it's a very interesting argument from John fifteen thirteen and fourteen. This is one of the uh, verses that Calvin uh, introduces or puts forth as biblical evidence for his teaching of the limited atonement. Okay, so how would we respond to that? Right? How how would how might we respond to Calvin's argument? that John 15, 13, and 14 teach a limited atonement. That when the Bible says that Jesus laid down his life for his friends, and that that group of people is identified as those who keep his commandments. How, how do we go about saying that isn't an expression of the um, of limited atonement? And I just want to give, I, I, we're going to put this entirely in worldly terms. So if you look at the top of page 4, What's important to note is that when you refer to the subset of a category, 
you do not necessarily exclude the larger set of which the subset is a part. Okay? Now, don't worry about that. This, here's the example. Statement number one. Jesus loves Packers and Vikings fans. Okay? Now, you might not think that's true, but it is. <laughs> Biblically true. Jesus loves both Packers and Vikings fans. That is a biblical truth that can be supported by any number of biblical passages. Now let's just say that in a different context, I made this statement. Jesus loves Packers fans. Statement two is true without making statement one false. Both of the statements are true. It's just that the first statement covers more than the second statement does. Okay, Now, what, so this is how I respond to Calvin. I say, yeah, there are passages that speak about Jesus dying to take away the sins of his people. That's the subgroup. But there are also passages that describe Jesus taking away the sins of the whole world. That's the larger group. The fact that there are some passages that talk about Jesus taking away the sins of his people in no way invalidates all the passages that says that he dies for the sins of the whole world. In fact, you might say something like, the reason the Bible can say that Jesus dies for the sins of his people is because the Bible says that he dies for the sins of the whole world. Right? So um, this, this argument, this idea that this passage, and there are a couple of others that Calvin would cite, limits the atonement to one smaller group of people, that is, uh, believers, is an, in, it's an illogical argument, or it's a... It's, a, it's, an, it's an argument that doesn't hold um, because it fails to recognize that those passages which speak of Jesus dying for believers are really a subset of a set of passages that talk about Jesus dying for the whole world. Right? So I just kind of the, the big takeaway, the last or the fourth black dot that's almost all the way halfway through. Um, in the same way, saying that Jesus laid down his life for his friends is true without in any way limiting the extent of other statements which speak of Jesus' love for the whole world. Right? I don't have it up, so you have to tell me oh. the question mark. How he says, Calvin's idea on limited atonement gets really complicated when you add on the doctrine of election. Yeah, so Heidi's comment is, uh, when you get, when you, when you start talking about the limited atonement, which is, is one of the great um, pillars of Calvinism, then you get the doctrine of election, which is another great pillar of Calvinism, right? That God chooses already in eternity those who would be saved and those who would be damned. That's the Roman, that's the um, Calvinist teaching, right? Now we too believe in a doctrine of election, but we our doctrine of election says that God only chose in eternity those who would be saved. The Bible speaks, and nowhere does it speak about an election to damnation speaks about an election to salvation, but in no place does it speak about an election to damnation. Again, Calvin didn't think that Lutherans went far enough. Calvin said, you Lutherans got it half right when you said that there is an election to salvation. What you didn't do is complete the, the logical loop, which is that if he elected some to salvation, he by definition elected others to damnation. Um, and then the reason this kind of gets hairy, it gets, it gets troubling, is that if, if God elected some to be saved, and Jesus only died for those who are saved, then those whom God elected to be damned never had a chance. Right? There, there, there never was salvation available to them. And from our perspective, that, that gets you into some difficult situations, right? Like, what about the passage in 1 Timothy that says that God wants all people to be saved? What do you do with that passage? If Calvinist teaching is true, that God doesn't want all people to be saved, that he elected some to damnation, and that he didn't provide salvation for them because the, the extent of the atonement is limited to believers, how can you say that God wants all people to be saved? Or how do you deal with a statement like in 1 John 2, where John says that Jesus Christ is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, okay, our is referring to believers, he is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Where, Jesus actually, uh, where John actually contrasts 
believers versus non-believers, but he says that Jesus died for both. Right? That Jesus was twenty sacrifice for both our sins and the sins of the whole world. So um, Calvinism, the, the Calvinist statement on election, and really even the Calvinist statement on um, the extent of the atonement, is logical. It's logical. The problem is that it's not biblical. Okay? The biblical teaching is illogical. But we believe the biblical teaching because it's the biblical teaching. I'm not going to believe something that's logical if it goes against biblical teaching, even if it's logical. Right? There's a, there's a point at which my logic has to say, I give up. How can God be three distinct persons and one divine essence? How can three equal one? I haven't got a clue. My reason cannot grasp the doctrine of the Trinity. My reason can only go so far, and then I just my reason says, that's it, I give up, I'm done. I'm going to believe this because God's word says it, not because I can figure it out. And that is the step that Calvin just couldn't ever take. He, 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 all, he insisted, one of the great um, principles of his theological system was that God would never reveal anything to us that we couldn't understand. Right? And so he, he comes at theology from an entirely different perspective that Lutherans come to theology, and that's what leads to such widely divergent in, in theological interpretations. Remember what we said a couple of weeks ago, or maybe even a month ago? Whoever makes the rules wins the game. Whatever presuppositions are undergirding your theological ideas are going to greatly affect the outcome of your theology. Right? So one of the great presuppositions of Calvinism is that God, who's a logical God, would only reveal logical things to us. And we, but we don't, as Lutherans, we don't approach theology that way. We don't have that presupposition. In fact, we kind of expect that God is going to reveal things that we can't understand because he's God and we aren't. Okay, okay Rachel. Um, so Kyle says in response I think to how you respond to a Calvinist um, that that seems very clear cut. Um, but then what does the Calvinist say in response to your argument? Yeah, so, so the Calvinist, how does the Calvinist respond, right? How does he respond to what we would call the unlimited atonement, the doctrine of the unlimited atonement, that Christ died for all? It's really a logical argument, not a biblical one, okay? So really the logical argument is the sacrifice of Jesus cannot not work. I want you to think about that. The sacrifice of Jesus cannot not work. In other words, if Jesus really did die for all, then all would be saved. But obviously not all are saved. Nobody talks about those who are going to be condemned on the pages of Scripture more than Jesus does. Right? And so um, the, what the Calvinist is trying to, the Doctrine of Limited Atonement is the Calvinist trying to cut off universalism. The idea that Jesus died for all and so everybody's saved. What the Calvinist doesn't appreciate is the doctrine of objective justification. They focus so much on subjective justification that they deny objective justification. Now, a little later in this section, we're going to talk about Arminians who do the exact opposite. Um, they get so focused on objective justification, or on subjective justification, Right? Uh, sorry, objective, that they that they led astray when it comes to subjective justification. Um, so basically what I'd say is the Cal what the Calvinist is going to try to do is he's going to try to hold before your eyes those biblical passages which speak about Jesus dying only for the church. And what, But I what I want you and me to always have in mind as we confront Calvinists is that while it is true that there are passages that speak about Jesus dying for the church, that doesn't invalidate all the other passages which speak about Jesus' uh, sacrifice for all. Now again, Calvin, Calvin's kind of a conundrum, because when Calvin is talking about when he's expositing scripture, he, he's, he's really good. And then, so he'll exposit a whole long section of scripture, and then he'll kind of realize what I'm saying doesn't fit in with my theological system. 
And that's really why Beza is really, really, in reality, the father of Calvinism. Right? Because Beza is the one who said, we have to read the Bible through the lens of our theological system, not the other way around. Um, so it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting when we get to heaven. Calvin is going to be in heaven. I have no doubt about the fact that Calvin is going to be in heaven. When we get to heaven, it's going to be interesting. I want to ask Calvin, are you a Calvinist? Right? Calvin, are you a Calvinist? And, and I wouldn't be surprised if he said no. Um, but yeah, that's, that's a whole other thing that we could talk about. Um, okay, so just uh, the, whole, the whole point of that is that I want you to know, I want you to be aware that some people use John 15, 13, and 14 to challenge the doctrine of the unlimited atonement. So if that ever happens to you in a conversation, now you're prepared to respond. Right? You're, prepared, you're prepared to respond by saying, I know there are passages in the Bible that say that Jesus died for the church. But that doesn't invalidate all the other passages that say that he died for the world. In fact, the reason we can say he died for the church is because he died for the world. Okay, So that's, that's what polemics is. It's identifying a false teaching um, and kind of trying to put yourself in their place Right? Trying to say, what, what would lead them to say this? In other words, we always want to put the best construction on our words, on our neighbor's words and actions, even false teachers. Right? But then to be able to come back and respond, how would we respond to that as high view of scripture, Bible believing, sacrament, um, you know, supporting, championing Lutherans? Right? And that, that's really what polemics is all about. What do other people say? And then how would we respond? And this is a good example of just when, when you're naturally studying a book, those kinds of things are going to come up as you come across passages that are used by false teacher as proof passages for the, you know, supposedly proof passages for their false teaching. Um, using John 15, 13, and 14 to prove the, ex the limited atonement is a great example of why a text without its context becomes a pretext for a proof text. Okay, Rachel, put that on my tombstone. <laughs> text without its context becomes a pretext for a proof text. Right? If you, if you rip John 15, 13, and 14 out of the context of John 15 and out of the context of John's Gospel and out of the context of the New Testament and out of the context of the Bible itself, you can read it that way. Right? If you're only looking at verses 13 and 14 and you're ignoring everything else, then you can come away saying, yeah, Jesus only died for the elect. He only died for believers. Right? But you must put texts in their context. Okay? So, um, and this is a great example of how the wider context of Scripture helps us have the proper interpretation of what might seem to be a challenging set of verses. Okay, that's really all I had for 14, okay? Um, so let's move on to 15. So, yeah. Don Mallow would like you to say that three times fast. Yeah, I don't know that I can say it three times fast, but it's going to be in my tombstone, so uh, you can come and look at it. Um, that is, uh, we don't know exactly where that phrase comes from. We, you know, um, it's, it's kind of an anonymous saying. Um, however, it is... I think it's super important. In fact, I almost think it's the, it's the primary law of biblical interpretation. Right? Is context, context, context. We, we always have to put Bible passages in their context. If you rip passages out of their context, you can make them say whatever you want. Right? The Bible says, take an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. The only problem is that when you put it in the context of, of Matthew 5, Jesus says, don't take eye for eye and tooth for tooth. Right? But if you, if you remove the don't from the statement, you can say the Bible teaches us to take revenge. Right? So uh, this, it's, just, it's such an important principle that we should always keep in front of us. And, and obviously you don't have to know the, the tricky little phrase. But, but that, that idea that it's so important to put verses in context. Because if they're not in context, they can be made to say whatever you want to say. Whoever makes the rules wins the game. 
kind of would like you to repeat the phrase. Okay. So I can so, write it down. So here's the phrase, okay? A text without its context becomes a pretext for a proof text. Now, maybe I should just clarify it quickly. There's nothing wrong with a proof text in the truest sense of the word. Okay, so There are some people out there that will use proof text. The idea of a proof text is inherently evil. Right? Um, that's not true. We, do, we can use proof text. This is actually what we do in confirmation class. That's what we do in, much, in a much higher degree in dogmatics of the seminary. We, we look at a topic, and we look at all the passages that speak about that topic. And so, and if you want a proof text for the doctrine of the vicarious atonement, then you look at 2 Corinthians 5. Right? If you want a proof text for the uh, unlimited atonement, you might look at John 3.16. Those are proof texts. There's nothing wrong with proof texts. So long as the proof texts are correctly understood in their context. There's a sense in which, uh, th when we say proof text, I mean making, making a verse prove whatever biblical teaching you want it to prove at that particular moment. Right? So a text without its context becomes a pretext for a proof text. Or a way of saying it, the three laws of biblical interpretation, the three laws of real estate are location, location, location. The three laws of biblical interpretation are context, context, context. Okay? Yeah, Rachel Arnold says we should... Get printed on a T-shirt. <laughs> no, we could. Yeah, we try, to, try to find out who originally said it. But um, yeah. Okay. So um, with that, we're, we're going to go into verse 15, and now Jesus is going to bring this uh, friends analogy to its um, to its payoff. Right. So he said, "Greater love knows nothing than this than to lay down one's life for one's friends. You are my friends if you keep my commandments." And now here's the payoff. Why, or what is the significance of being Jesus' friend? So he says in verse 15, I no longer call you servants. The word is slaves, okay? The NIV is, is very sensitive to giving a wrong impression by using the word slave. Slave is very much, and very rightly so, is a dirty word in 21st century America because of the context of slavery in American history. Um, and so when, when, the, when the NIV writers, uh, or the, the translators, when they come across this word slave, they don't want you to think the kind of slavery that existed in 18th century America. However, remember that slavery is a very important concept in the first century world. If, you were in, if, if your church was following the um, traditional lectionary today, um, for today's, the 20th Sunday after Pentecost, um, Romans 6 is all about slavery, right? We are by nature slaves to sin, but because we've been set free from slavery to sin, we become slaves to righteousness. There's nothing wrong with talking about slavery to righteousness. Um, but I, just, I, I want you to know that um, also the beginning of all the letter, all of Paul's letters, almost, Paul almost always says, Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, and the NIV always translates Paul a servant of Christ Jesus, but it's much stronger than that. Right? Paul doesn't have a choice. He's a slave. Um, but anyway, um, so I no longer call you slaves because a slave does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. For everything that I learned from my father, I have made known to you. So here's the payoff of this friend's metaphor. Is Jesus is going to contrast being a friend with being a slave. And here's, the, um, here's the, the payoff of the metaphor, right? A slave doesn't get the big picture, right? The master doesn't sit down with the slave and lay out all of his business ventures to explain how the slave's role in his carrying out his instructions fits into the larger whole. The, the master just gives the guy commands, and the guy carries out the commands. That's what a slave does. A slave does not have access to the big picture. 
But we as disciples of Jesus do have access to the big picture. That is why Jesus has come. He's come to reveal the Father to us. He's come to reveal the heart and the will and the plan that God has for the whole world. He recruits us to be a part of that. We're not just slaves. That he says, you better go do this. And I'm not going to tell you why to go do this. You just go do it. He, he actually explains the role of Christian obedience in the bigger plan of salvation. And, and that's, what, that's why it's so amazing to be called Jesus' friend. Um, so when we sing one of the most famous, mm -hmm. most beloved hymns, when we sing at a church, the volume level is higher than you know, almost any other hymn. What a friend we have in Jesus. Okay? What a friend we have in Jesus is based on John 15, 15. That we are Jesus' friends. Our friend is, Jesus is a friend to us. Um, there are other, some other beautiful passages, right? Um, and the, the, the writer of the Hebrews um, usually calls us Jesus' brothers and sisters. We're members of the same family. That's a completely different analogy, a completely different metaphor. Right? But not only are we members of his family, in other words, you don't get to pick your family, you do get to pick your friends. Right? Jesus picked us to be his friends. He wasn't stuck with us as brothers and sisters. He picked us to be his friends. He chose us. And that is exactly where the next verse goes. It goes into this act of choosing our electing. Okay? But I've been going for, you know, 45 minutes here. So, um, and we've had a couple people chime in. If you have any other questions or comments about verses 13, 14, or 15, let's just pause for a second, give you a chance to ask those questions before we launched into the last two verses of this paragraph. Okay, nothing is coming in, but uh, if you're typing something, please feel free to complete it and send it, and then we'll circle back to it. Okay, but remember verse 15, we have this analogy or this metaphor of being friends of Jesus. We want to think this idea, you choose your friends, you pick your friends. Jesus chose us, he picked us. And that's the thought that is going to be advanced in verse 17. Or sorry, verse 16. So um, this is John 15, 16. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. And so that whatever you ask in my name, the Father will give you. Right, now we have some... Um, this is just a beautiful example of Jesus pulling ideas from earlier in the discourse back to our attention. So we have things like um, bearing fruit. Remember, that's that's imagery from the extended metaphor. I am the branches. Or I am the vine. You are the branches. If you bear, you must remain in me to bear fruit. Right? Um, we have this idea of our fruit being the response to prayer. Whatever you ask in, the, in my name, the Father will grant you. Right? So we have, um, we have some, some other language from earlier in the discussion bringing brought in, but now it gets advanced one step further to this idea of choosing. You did not choose me, but I chose you. Okay? Um, so this is a, a beautiful example or a beautiful passage that teaches the truth that we cannot, by our own thinking or choosing, believe in Jesus Christ our Lord or come to him. Right? Um, Jesus explicitly says that we do not choose him, that he chooses us. Right? We don't decide to be Christians. Um, the Holy Spirit works faith in our hearts. I want you to um, look at the bottom of page 4. Um, look at uh, two other corresponding phrases from John's first epistle. Right now, the guy who wrote John, First John, is the same guy who wrote the Gospel of John. Right, so it's not surprising that there are a whole bunch of connections between the Gospel and the letters of John. That's actually a really interesting study. Um, but I just want to point out these two verses from First John, and they're both from First John four. Um, John says, "This is love. This is what love looks like. 
not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Right? This is love. Not that we chose God, not that we loved God, but that he chose us, that he loved us. Maybe even the greater explanation is in 1 John 4, 19. Why do we love God? We love God because he first loved us. Right? Um, our love for God is dependent upon and flows from God's love for us. Not the other way around. God doesn't love us because we love him. We love God because he loves us. And so but I, what I think is really interesting is that what the apostle, what First John describes in terms of loving, John's gospel, or Jesus and John's gospel describes in terms of choosing. But they're interchangeable. What does it mean to be chosen? It means to be loved. What does it mean to be loved? It means to be chosen. Okay, Rachel. Kyle asks, why doesn't the Holy Spirit connect with all? Yeah, okay, so this is a great question. Kyle asks, um, all people are, in, are e inherently sinful. We're all equally evil. Right? None of us can participate in our coming to faith. It is entirely and only the act of the Holy Spirit. Well, if that's the case, then why doesn't the Holy Spirit create faith in everybody's heart? Right? And so we want to say these two things that, guess what, are illogical and yet biblical. So on the one hand, what is biblical is that we cannot, by our own thinking or choosing, believe in Jesus Christ our Lord and come down. That if you are a believer, it is only and entirely because of the work of the Holy Spirit. That is a biblically true thing. On the other hand, there are passages that make it clear that you can reject the work of the Holy Spirit. You can resist. You can prevent him from creating faith in your heart. You can't cause him to create faith, but you can prevent him from creating faith. If you're a believer, it is entirely and only the work of God. And if you are an unbeliever, it is entirely, entirely and only your own fault. God gets all the credit for believers and the sinner, the unbeliever, gets all the blame for being an unbeliever. Now a Calvinist, both a Calvinist and Arminian are jumping up in their seats right now and they're saying that's not logical. right? Um, to which we'd say, I know it's not logical, but it's biblical. And that's why I believe it. Not because it's logical, but because it's biblical. In other words, another way of answering a question, Kyle, would be to say, the Spirit wants to create faith in all. Uh, however, he doesn't create faith in, in the hearts of those who reject him. What we don't want to do, though, is turn that statement around and pat ourselves on the back and say, well, the reason the Holy Spirit created faith in my heart is because I didn't reject him. What a great guy I am. Right? That's what the other biblical truth is trying to prevent. So you hold on to both of those truths, that if we're saved, it's entirely God's doing, and if we're lost, it's entirely our own fault. And you won't let you don't let go of either truth. You hold on to them both, even though there's tension between them. Okay, um I have five more minutes. Let's uh let's just introduce um the way that John fifteen sixteen is abused. Okay? Um and now we're gonna talk about Arminians, okay? Arminian, uh, um, so we have Lutherans are the theological descendants of Martin Luther. Calvinists are the theological descendants of John Calvin. And Arminians are the theological descendants of, I think it's John Arminius. Um, I'd have to go back and look at his first name. But his last name is Arminius. That's where they get the, the, the contact Arminian, Arminianism from. And what, uh, Jacob, Jacob Arminius. What Jacob Arminius um, believed, he looked at what Calvin taught. And he said, everything Calvin believed is wrong. He is the anti-Calvin. Okay? If Calvin says up, Arminius says down. And if Calvin says left, then Arminius says right. Okay? He's the anti-Calvin. So Calvin said that um, the, the, the extent of the atonement is limited, that Jesus only died for believers. Well, Arminius is the anti-Calvin. So Arminius said, oh, no, no. When Jesus died, for the, died, he died for the sins of the whole world. Everybody. 
He taught an unlimited atonement. It's pretty much the only right thing that Arminianism teaches, is the extent of the atonement. Calvin taught, following Luther, Calvin taught that if you're saved, it is entirely and only a work of God. Right? Now, Calvin also taught that if you're lost, it is entirely and only the work of God. Because God chose someone to be saved, he chose the rest to be condemned. So Arminius is going to push back the other way. He's going to say, no, 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 if you're saved, if you're lost, if a person is lost, it's because they rejected. You cannot blame God for anybody being lost. But that means, if it's true, logically speaking, if it's true that I'm to blame if I'm lost, it's also true that I get a little bit of credit if I'm saved. That those who are lost are lost because they choose to be lost, and those who are saved are saved because they choose to be saved. This is where the term decision theology comes from. Those who are saved are those who make a decision to be saved. Make a decision for Christ. That's our many in teaching about justification. Right? Jesus died for the sins of all, and the way that, that, that you personally benefit from that is by you choosing to believe in him. Now, we would say it's impossible. You and I can't choose to believe in Jesus. Because we're by nature dead, blind enemies of God, right? We have as much chance of believing in Jesus as does a blind man in a pitch black room looking for a black cat that isn't there. Okay? It's never going to happen. But that's what Arminius taught, is that, is that in order to be saved, you have to make a decision. You have to choose to believe in Jesus. And you can imagine that all the Lutheran and Calvinist Theologians are standing up and saying, but what about John 15, 16, where Jesus says, you did not choose me, but I chose you. Isn't it like the ultimate anti-Arminian verse? It is. It is the ultimate anti-Arminian verse. But we're going to kind of play that polemics game, right? If you're convinced that the reason that some are saved is because they made a decision for Jesus, what do you do with a verse like John 15, 16? which very explicitly is how Jesus saying, I did not choose you, uh, you did not choose me, but I chose you. What does an Arminian do with that? Well, what they do is they focus on the second part. You did not, cho you did not choose me, but I chose you to go bear fruit. In other words, an Arminius, Arminian would say that John, John 15, 16 is not about how we get right with God. It's about how we live out our lives of faith. Right? That you choose to be a believer, but that once you choose to be a believer, it is the work of Christ in you that is, that is your fruitfulness, that leads to your fruitfulness. And so what they want to do is they want to take John 15, 16 out of the context of justification and put it only and completely on sanctification. And I have notes, I, I'm not going to go through them all, but in the notes you're going to see, I'll explain why this is kind of nonsensical, right? It, 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 it confuses justification and sanctification. It says something very laudable about sanctification, right? That we cannot, um, that the, the power to live our lives for God doesn't come from within, it comes from above, right? Um, but we made a big deal earlier in our discussions that while we cannot participate in our justification, we do and must cooperate in our sanctification. This makes absolutely no sense to say that we must cooperate in our justification and cannot cooperate in our sanctification. Because in reality, it's the opposite. Right? In the reality, we cannot participate in our justification, how we get right with God. We can and must participate in our sanctification, the life that we live out of thanks for that. So how would we respond, right? How might we as Lutherans respond to an Arminian who says that your whole uh, you can uh, you cannot by my own thinking or choosing thing that your father Calvin taught or wrote that um, that's a misunderstanding of John fifteen sixteen. How would we respond? Well, we would say your understanding of John fifteen sixteen incorrectly confuses justification and sanctification, which at its heart, which um, is really a symptom of a greater problem. It confuses law and gospel. And it confuses law and gospel. The law tells us it is impossible for us to save ourselves. The gospel tells us that God has saved us in spite of ourselves. The law tells us 
as Christians, this is how I want you to live. This is how you are to seek. So you are to try to live a life that is pleasing to me. Um, and, and, as, and so we can and must follow that. We must participate in that. So what Arminians do with this particular passage is they flip it. They, they, they mix justification and sanctification. Rachel. Rhonda asks, who are the Arminians of today? So, um, so Rhonda's quite, well, who are the Arminians of today? Yeah, you're not going to really get anybody that ever puts that on their church board, like Bethlehem Arminian Church. You know, that, you're not going to see that. Um, but Arminianism is the dominant, at least when it comes to justification, how we get right with God, is the dominant uh, American Christian idea of how we get right with God. It is the official statement of the Southern Baptist Convention which is the largest non-Catholic organization in America. So most Baptists believe in making a decision for Jesus. Most Methodists, most Church of Christ, um, most, I can kind of think of anything that isn't Catholic or Calvin or Lutheran, you can put in that other group. Billy Graham. Billy Graham is a great example. His whole ministry was aimed at leading people to make a decision for Jesus. Now what's really dangerous is that Billy Graham mixed Arminianism and justification with Calvinism and preservation. So he believed that it was his job to get people to make a decision for Jesus and that once they'd made a decision for Jesus, they could never lose their faith. So that he went into a stadium and he, he's a powerful preacher, powerfully preached about how important it was for people to make a decision for Jesus, and then he left because he didn't think it was important for him to stay around and help keep people in the faith. And this is why our pastors are pastors and not only evangelists. Right? And the, the Great Commission has two parts. Go and make disciples by baptizing, and then go and keep disciples by teaching. Right? The church has to do both. Um, so yeah, Billy Graham is maybe the, a, is a perfect example of somebody whose whole ministry was based on the idea that it is our job to make somebody make a decision for Jesus. You want to manipulate their emotions so that they make a decision for Jesus. As Lutherans, we've always resisted having our worship manipulate emotions doesn't mean that Lutheran worship can't appeal to emotions. In fact, I think it should. I think that sometimes Lutheran worship practices have gone too far the other way, right? Where we've, we've considered appealing to the emotions to being wrong. That's not the case, right? But when your worship is designed to manipulate emotions, that is wrong. Okay, so we have all kinds of ways and trails off of there um, but uh, so I just want to this is an interesting section of scripture because it provi it's a proof text that's used both for Calvinism and for Arminianism and we want to be able to respond to both alright verse 17 is really just a summary verse of everything we've read in chapter 15 so far right? this is my command so in summary this is my command love each other and that's going to be the launching point for the rest of the upper room discourse. And what you'll notice if you still have your Bible open and you look at verse 18, the next concept that is going to be introduced is the concept of hate, the opposite of love. Okay, So that's where we're going to go. Next week we're going to start in John 15, 18. Um, and our goal will, will be to finish chapter 15 or maybe get as close as we can to chapter 15, and talk about how this, this love theme that is laid out in 9 through 17 continues to be advanced um, in the Upper Room Discourse. So thank you so much for joining us and for giving me a few extra minutes to ramble on about other things. Um, let's close with a blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be and abide with us always. Amen. God's blessings. <laughs>